Hello Year 6 and welcome to the next chapter of our reading session where we're reading Uncle Montague's Tales of Terror and hopefully you listen to the last part of uh, the first chapter which was uh, called Climb Not. Um, I definitely felt a bit creeped out by that one and that last chapter introduced us um, to a new story which seems to be a bit of a pattern. Um, at the end of each chapter, we get introduced to a new story by Uncle Montague. So let's just have a little recap. Who is our protagonist? And the next story is something to do with a seance and a doll. And what predictions do you have about what will happen in the story? So just pause the video and have a little think about those. Our protagonist is Edgar, uh, and he um, is listening to stories told by Uncle Montague, who I think is a slightly odd character because he certainly lives in an odd house and uh, he certainly has some odd things happening in his house about this mysterious servant called Franz, some slightly kind of creepy descriptions of um, shadows and the object in the room. Uh, and he's telling Edgar spooky stories, which Edgar doesn't believe, but really likes to listen to. Uh, the next story is something to do with a seance. I don't know if you remember, but a seance was um, where a person gathers a group of people around and they try to contact the dead. And Edgar doesn't believe this can happen, but Uncle Montague is about to tell us a story that perhaps might uh, change his mind. Maybe it will change us. Uh, and it's also about a doll. And I know that when I was younger, my sister used to tell me creepy stories about possessed dolls that were coming to get me. And that used to really scare me. So I'm thinking perhaps this story is something to do with a possessed doll coming to get the uh, main characters in that story that Uncle Edgar's about to tell. But well, uh, Uncle Montague's about to tell, but we'll see how that goes as we go through. Here are some unfamiliar words, words you might see, which are highlighted in red in the text. Uh, the first one is velvet drapes. The velvet is a material that's a bit shiny uh, and very thick, and in big old houses they have it covering the windows and doors, which are often massive. They're very thick and dark and heavy, so it looks a bit like these curtains here. Clientele uh, is a noun, that's customers, that's the people who you're serving in a shop or something. Sophisticated is an adjective, uh, and that describes something or someone as posh or classy or very elegant, uh, like a fancy restaurant, you might say, is very sophisticated. Credible is um, an adjective, which means believable. And if you put um, in in front of it, it becomes incredible, which means unbelievable, which is kind of what incredible means. Doting means devoted or caring. So if you dote on someone, it means you really care about them and look after them. Stained glass is uh, a noun, and that's something you might see in churches or other kind of religious buildings. And the glass is all different colours, and it's got a picture on it. And so when the sun shines through it, it kind of, uh, it lights up. And so you get the glasses still see through, but it's stained different colours. Tremulous means wobbling or shivering or nervous. So your voice might be tremulous if you're feeling a bit scared and you're doing a presentation. Or a bridge might be tremulous if it's uh, very wobbly and rickety and difficult to cross. Plaintiff means sad or pleading. Uh, and it's normally used to describe like a song or a way someone is talking. Unaccountably means the same thing as mysteriously. A charlatan is a is a person that is a fraudster, a trickster or a faker. So someone who's pretending they know loads more than they actually do uh, to try and trick you, mostly out of money. Brusquely means quickly and firmly. So you might tell someone off brusquely, not really aggressive, but just quick and firm, or you might Brush down your coat brusquely to get rid of some dust. Ushered means moved or guided, and that's in a kind of gentle way, like you might gently put your hands on someone's back and move them around, ushering them into a room or out of a room. Laudanum is an old fashioned type of medicine that they made, people made from poppies, and they used it to um, make people feel very sleepy and help them if they were feeling uh, hysterical. Stilted means rough or something that's not done smoothly. So if your speaking um, is a bit stilted, it means it stops all the time and is a bit juddery. 
like that but it could also be a surface is a bit stilted like the surface of a very old tree is stilted because it's all rough and the last word is odious which means hateful so if you find something really despicable and awful you'd say it's an odious like picking your nose is an odious habit it's a disgusting hateful habit and here's what i'm thinking about when i read today um i'm thinking about being a detective so part of the fun thing about these types of stories these short ghost stories is you get to try and figure out the mystery in them so i'm asking questions in my head all the time that's trying to help me figure out what's happening uh, as we go along and when i come to the end of um the the chapter then i'll go through some of the questions that i was asking to try and guess um what the outcome of the story is and again this is a long chapter so i'm going to tell it in two parts each one about 15 minutes so i'm going to share with you a kindle and then i'll start reading So this chapter is called The Undoor. Harriet edged backwards towards the door as her mother began to speak. It was dark at the outer edges of the room, though it was only two in the afternoon. The heavy velvet drapes at the window blocked the light of day. The only illumination in the room was a lamp in the centre of an oval table, around which were seated eight women, whose expectant faces were lit by its greenish glow. Is there anyone there? asked Harriet's mother in the odd, trapped in a well voice she reserved for these occasions. A voice that her clientele seemed to find haunting, but which Harriet always found faintly ridiculous. Are there any among the spirit world who wish to come forward and contact their loved ones here today? Actually, the truth was, Maud was not Harriet's mother at all, and that was not the only lie they told, not by a long way. For one thing, Leon's was not Maud's real name. It was Briggs. They took the name Leon's at Harriet's suggestion. Harriet's own name was Foster because it sounded more sophisticated. They told people they were mother and daughter because it made them feel at ease. They had just enough of a familial resemblance to make it work. But in any case, as con artists, they knew that in the main, people simply accepted whatever you told them, provided it was credible. Harriet and Maud had met in a workhouse on the Kilburn Road. They got the idea for the con when one of the other women told them about a seance she had seen her mistress host when she had been a parlour maid. The maid had stolen from the guests and been caught and kicked out, hence her presence in the workhouse, but Harriet had seen straight away there was money to be made and gone about in the right way. They refined this piece of opportunism by taking control of the seance themselves. They advertised in one of the Better Ladies magazines and presented themselves as experienced medium and doting daughter. Spiritualism was all the rage, and they found their gullible clientele needed very little convincing. It was Maud's job to commune with the spirits of the departed, and while the ladies, and sometimes gentlemen, were busy listening to her wails and mutterings, Harriet would raid the coats and bags, taking small but valuable items that would not be readily missed. If a pair of earrings or a silver snuff box was discovered missing a week later, the devout mother and daughter who helped contact their dear departed loved ones would hardly be suspected of involvement. And even if they were, they would be long gone. They had already decided that they should leave London for pastures new. Maud knew some people in Manchester. There was a lot of money up north. Another week or two, and they would have changed their names and be buying their tickets at Euston Station. Harriet back through the door and out into the hall, just as she had done in so many houses over the last months. She blinked into the relative brightness once she was out of the gloomy drawing room. The afternoon sun was streaming in through the stained glass above the front door and making a jewelled light on the walls. Maud's voice seeped through the wall, tremulous and plaintive. Harriet smiled to herself and made her way back down the hall and up the stairs. The servants had been given the afternoon off at their suggestion, but she was careful as always not to enter the room above the seance in case a squeaking floorboard might alert one of the group. She opened the door and peered in, ready to make her excuses about being lost if it was occupied. But there was no one in the room, which evidently belonged to children, girls, judging by the amount of lace and the enormous doll's house. It was certainly of no interest to Harriet, who quickly closed the door and moved on. None of the rooms proved very interesting, in fact. 
Mrs Barnard clearly did not trust her servants and had locked away anything of any value. Although Harriet had managed to lift a few interesting items and a little cash from the bags and coats of the women at the seance, it was hardly a memorable haul. As she returned downstairs, she saw two doors to her left that she hadn't noticed before and wondered if there might be anything worth investigating in them. She turned the handle of the left-hand door. Just as she did so, a voice behind her made her jump. I shouldn't go in there if I were you. Harriet turned to see a girl standing behind her, a little younger than herself. She was dressed in expensive, if rather old-fashioned, clothes. Hello there, said Harriet, with her most winning smile. What's your name, then? Olivia. Olivia, said Harriet. That's a pretty name. Well, I'm sorry, Olivia. I'm afraid I was lost. Lost? said the girl with a little snort. Harriet did not much like her tone. Yes, said Harriet, but the door was locked. I see now I came the wrong way. The door is not locked, miss, said Olivia, stepping closer in a way that Harriet found unaccountably threatening. It is blocked. We call it the undoor. The undoor, said Harriet. Olivia nodded, smiling even more. That's what we call it, she said, because it's a door. But it's not a door, do you see? Well, if the door is blocked, Olivia, why tell me I shouldn't enter? Asked Harriet, trying to retain her temper. I could hardly go through a door that is blocked now, could I? Olivia carried on smiling, but made no reply. Harriet scowled. Anyway, said Harriet, turning away. I must get on. She walked towards the drawing room, in which the seance was taking place. She turned back as she opened the door, but the girl was gone. Harriet re-entered the seance just as silently as she had left. She took a few seconds to adjust her eyes to the gloom, and when she did so, she could see Maud staring ahead in a trance. Harriet had to admit it. Maud really did look the part. Harriet glanced around the table. It was the usual mixture of the curious and the desperate, sad widows in their black clothes and jet jewellery, bored wives looking for a thrill. She stifled a yawn. Suddenly, Maud began to scream. Please, she shouted. Maud, for God's sake, help me, help me. The voice was so wild, it made the whole room gasp, and Harriet was as taken aback as anyone else, especially to hear Maud using her own name. Harriet was momentarily rooted to the spot. Help me, Maud screamed. For God's sake, help me, Maud, Maud. Harriet pushed forward and grabbed Maud and tried to calm her down. Had Harriet not known Maud was a charlatan, she would have said that she was possessed. Her whole body seemed to be in spasm, as if she had been struck by lightning. Goodness, said an excited voice to her left. Is Mrs. Leon's all right? Quite well, said Harriet brusquely. And indeed, Maud did seem to be coming out of it. She blinked up at Harriet. Does anyone know a Maud? said Mrs. Bern Barnard, looking around the table. What's that? said Maud, startled at hearing her own name. That's right, mother, said Harriet, frowning at her. You were saying the Ma name Maud just now. Maud stared back, confused. I think perhaps Mother has overtired herself, said Harriet. Perhaps we should end it there. There was a groan of disappointment from the assembled ladies, but Mrs Barnard said that, of course, Mrs Leons must not exhaust herself and that perhaps she ought to take a turn around the garden. Harriet agreed and took Maud outside as the guests collected their things and began to leave, with Mrs Barnard thanking each of the ladies in turn. Harriet took Maud by the arm and led her away to a more secluded part of the garden. What the devil were you playing at in there? hissed Harriet. You were using your own name, your real name. You're trying to get us put away, you silly wench. Don't you talk to me like that, said Maud, still trying to shake off her wooziness. Or I'll... Oh, you're what? whispered Harriet. You think I'm scared of you? Don't make me laugh. What are you up to? Maud shook off Harriet's grip and took a deep breath. I don't know, said Maud sleepily. I don't remember. It was as if the voice was coming from somewhere else. Here, you don't think I can re really, you know... Harriet laughed. What? Really hear the bleeding dead? Are you on the chin again? Maud made no reply. She had a strange, bemused look on her face, and Harriet began to wonder if she was having some kind of seizure. Are you all right, Maud? she asked, more annoyed than concerned. I don't know, said Maud, turning to Harriet. I don't know. Harriet saw Mrs Barnard coming and nudged Maud in the ribs. Mrs. Leons, I must thank you once again, said Mrs. Barnard, walking towards them. The ladies all agreed that it was quite the most illuminating session we have had, particularly when you were host to that poor creature at the end. 
Do you have any idea who she might be? We are all baffled. Harriet raised an eyebrow. No, said Maud uncomfortably. I'm afraid I do not. It may have been a wandering spirit calling out for help, suggested Harriet. Oh dear, said Mrs Barnard, squeezing her hands together. Do you think so? The poor thing. She shook her head sadly, her eyes closed as if in prayer. Harriet rolled her eyes at Maud, but Maud seemed to be staring off into the distance. The next moment, she staggered sideways into Harriet's arms. Goodness, said Mrs Barnard, I think Mrs Leons is feeling faint. Won't you please come back inside? No, no, said Maud. I am sure I shall be quite well. I must insist, said Mrs Barnard. Perhaps a glass of sherry? Yes, said Maud, brightening at the thought of a drink. It is rather early, but perhaps just this once for medicinal reasons. What is the matter with you? hissed Harriet, as they followed Mrs Barnard back inside. You were supposed to keep her outside. I don't feel quite right, said Maud pitifully. Honestly, I don't. You ain't right in the head if you ask me, said Harriet, suddenly smiling sweetly as she saw Mrs Barnard looking back towards them. Mrs Barnard ushered them through the front door. Please go on in, Mrs Leons, she said. Sit yourself down and I shall fetch us some sherry. I would send for a doctor, but the servants will not be back for an hour or so. That won't be necessary, said Maud, going for the nearest door handle. Not that one, mother, said Harriet. That door's blocked. Blocked, said Maud. Yes, replied Harriet. The undoor, they call it, I believe. Mrs Barnard stared at her in amazement. Now, how would you know a thing like that? Harriet shifted uncomfortably, realising she had made a slip letting on that she had looked around the house while the seance had been in progress. Never lie more than you have to, she told herself. The truth always sounds more convincing. Your daughter told me, Harriet said in control once more. My daughter, said Mrs Barnard, looking puzzled. Olivia, said Harriet with a smile. Olivia, said Mrs Barnard. You met Olivia? Well, I had stepped out for a little air, continued Harriet breezily, and I thought I might find a glass of water. I was trying the door handle when Olivia, prompted Mrs Barnard, when Olivia appeared and told me that the door did not lead anywhere and told me that you called it the undoor. The under, repeated Maud, becoming increasingly confused. The undoor, Mrs Leonce, said Mrs Barnard. And Olivia told you that. How clever of her. Please come this way. Mrs Barnard took them through to the room in which the seance had been held. The curtains were pulled back and daylight chased away all the atmosphere Maud and Harriet had painstakingly created for the benefit of the ladies. It had returned to being a rather ordinary, stuffy drawing room. Mrs Barnard opened one of the French windows to let in some air and went over to the drinks cabinet and poured three glasses of sherry. Come with me, ladies, she said, handing them a glass each. As she walked away, Maud stared at Harriet with a questioning look, but Harriet merely frowned and followed Mrs Barnard back down the hall. Do you see how these two doors are evenly spaced? she said. They nodded. Well... It seems that at some point many years ago, they decided to take down a wall and open the two next door rooms into one large room as we have it now. I am told that they did not want to spoil the symmetry of the hall, and so left this door here. She indicated the left-hand one, then turned the handle of the door to its right. They followed her through. As you can see, she said, the door, the undoor, does not appear on this side of the wall. Maud gave Harriet a slight nod of her head towards the cabinet nearby full of nicely concealable silver trinkets. Harriet nodded back. Come, I have something else I would like to show you, said Mrs Barnard. That is, if you are quite recovered. Me, said Maud. Oh, I'm quite all right, my dear. You are so kind to be concerned. But we ought to be going, really, shouldn't we, Harriet? Oh, but you have time to see the doll's house, she said. The doll's house, said Harriet. I'm not really sure we have, began Maud, but Mrs Barnard was already leading them out of the room and towards the stairs. After a moment's pause, they followed on behind. I'm going to stop there uh, so you can stop for today and take up the second session another day or straight away afterwards if you're feeling really keen.